Hello and welcome to Sean White's Solar and Energy Storage Podcast. I have Keith Cronin here and he is going to do this podcast with me. Keith is another instructor for HeatSpring. So we're both HeatSpring brothers, even though we don't even know each other that well. We're just kind of getting to know each other. And I want to find out more about what he does. And I'm sure that you do too, or else you wouldn't be here listening to me talking to Keith. So, hey, Keith, what's up? John, thanks for inviting me to your show, and thanks for the nice welcome introduction. Yeah, cool. And so some of the things that I do is I do a lot of classes on HeatSpring. It's a good portion of my business, especially due to COVID. So I love the HeatSpring platform. It's been really helpful because it's online, and I swear I didn't cause that Wuhan virus. It wasn't me, but I did maybe benefit from it, you know? So it's not like I'm in cahoots with whoever started that COVID virus you know, in their secret lab playing with bats or whatever it is. I don't know. I just kind of get a kick out of all these like crazy conspiracy theories going on. But anyway, it wasn't me. It wasn't a conspiracy. So people could sell more online classes or was it? I don't know. Yeah. (laughs) Maybe it was those guys, Brian and Duncan over at HeatSpring. Maybe they started it. Those are the guys that founded HeatSpring. Probably was them, you know, because it's just good online classes are good for business. So anyway, so I kind of specialize in classes that are getting people NAPSEP certified. And then Keith, he does a solar MBA class, which is really cool. So maybe just kind of let you talk a little bit about your class. Yeah, so that uh, Genesis story started a long, long time ago. I had a small solar company in Hawaii and sold it to Sun Edison in August of 2007. And then soon thereafter, I started doing consulting work. And a friend of mine was an attorney who I knew back to the early days of doing structured finance deals. I said, you know, It'd be great, you know, post the financial crisis, which is in that 2008 period into 2009, that was a September. What we realized a lot of people couldn't afford like in-person training. So somehow I stumbled upon HeatSpring and I looked at what they were doing and I said, hey, how about we can create a class? So I'd already contacted uh, Duncan and Brian and started doing some of my own classes on there. Then I convinced my attorney friend Chris to do the MBA class. And so we took some time to really kind of book in the industry from development plan to financial modeling and all the other accoutrements that go into that and getting companies to like maybe fail more quickly, you know, because the development cycle is long, the sales process is long, you know, land acquisition, documents, contracts, and running your business and executing successfully and dealing with utilities. All those things were really difficult. In the early days, the difficult part was financing. And today the difficult part is interconnection. So it's been a decade since we've been teaching this class. We've had about 500 students, which has been great all over the world. And it's actually allowed me to travel over the world to work with clients sometimes as, hey, come down to South America or come to Southeast Asia. So that's been something I've been doing for, again, for a decade with Chris. And then some of the other stuff that I've been teaching on HeatStrings platform and on my own, because I realize, again, sometimes people don't have time for training. They want to do it at night when they get home from work. Or, uh, you know, maybe they're outside of our industry and they want to kind of come into the industry. There's a lot of, I think, you know, oil and natural gas kind of refugees that are coming into our space that want to learn. So whether it's small businesses, large, want to get better first, not bigger first, at least that's always been my goal. Because we've seen what happens when companies try to get big really fast. Either sales uh, gets too ahead of themselves and they can't execute on the operational side or vice versa. So it's just trying to give people some metrics and some goals and some accountability within the organization so that they can kind of blossom and flourish and add other aspects of their businesses, you know, where they want to add other services to their companies. So I thought it was kind of interesting. One of the things that you talked about was oil and gas refugees coming over here to solar. That's pretty cool. You know, where the solar and wind are taken over, especially with energy storage and what we're doing is we're the cheapest energy in the world. So it's just kind of stupid to do anything else. And those oil and gas, those poor people, we're inviting them in. I've always thought that too, that that oil and gas companies are totally set up to put up huge infrastructure projects like these big solar projects and welcoming these people in. But that also brings me back to how you were telling me that you sold your company to Sun Edison. So that's pretty interesting. And so, of course, Sun Edison is kind of a famous company that you probably could explain a lot better than me. So there's this solar celebrity, Jigger Shaw, who works for the Department of Energy right now. And so you got to know him, I guess. Did he run a hard bargain when he bought your company? (laughs) 
Yeah, well, I met Jigger probably about 20 years ago. At that time, for people that don't know, he was actually working at BP Solar and he was trying to, you know, distribute products and back to the BP Solar being BP, the oil company. Yeah, like an oil refugee. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So it's ironic, that segue. But so, yeah, he actually came out to Hawaii. Our families met and we developed a relationship. You know, you have this idea for St. Edison, right? And this idea of service, which I think we see everywhere today. We see software as a service. We're going to eventually see storage as a service. And we had solar as a service. And the basic idea of a power plant essentially is that, you know, there's a lot of capex to build a power plant, whether it's oil, coal, natural gas, nuclear, and then there's the OPEX, which is generally sometimes much less than the CAPEX. But really, that's what we're getting when we pay our electric bill every month from our local utility is, you know, we're getting a little slice of that. And it's obviously chopped up into a pie chart, whatever their percentages of fuel cost, administrative cost, and all the other things. So, you know, we always talked about this. It wouldn't it be cool if people can do financing for solar. And back then, there were some people that were dipping their toe in there under the auspices of doing leasing. But it really was kind of a little bit murky. Again, but the idea of financing stuff has been around probably since the dawn of time, right? And I think even the Dutch were the first people to create a stock exchange. So anyway, as this thing started manifesting, you know, Jigger started saying, hey, you want to join the Conga line? And, and I did. And as we can see, as a result of all those micro steps that our industry took, you know, when you saw, again, back to the, that time period, 08, 09, the compound annual growth rate on a declining scale just for solar panels, which were at the time probably the most expensive component of the industry, started dropping. And uh, we briefly made a cash grant for tax credit, which helped actually, I think, bring in more people. And again, the Chinese took the technology and perfected it and made it really good and dropped down the price like they've done with many things. So it created this perfect storm, I believe, to compete with fossil fuels and with you know, bringing the preeminence of solar, you know, from what we would have considered something we would put at a remote station in Alaska or on a satellite, and now we're able to put on people's homes. So it's really been great to see what's happened in the last decade plus with our industry. So you sold your company to Sun Edison. What was the name of your company? It was Island Energy Solutions. Island Energy. And which island were you on? I was on the island of Oahu, but we did island on almost all the islands. Uh, all so you were out there in Hawaii. 20 years ago, which was like the solar industry was totally different back then. It's probably somewhere almost on the magnitude of a thousand times bigger than it was then, I think. Or at least, you know, if we looked at the installed capacity in the world, I know like around the year 2000, we were at about one gigawatt. And right now we're going to cross one terawatt, a thousand times that installed capacity in the world right now. It was a lot different then. Were you doing a lot of grid tied or battery systems or what were you doing then? Well, yeah, it's a great question. So to rewind back to that 1998, 1999 era, when I first started, you know, people couldn't even say photovoltaic, right? And Hawaii had a pretty, at the time, a pretty robust solar hot water program because of our peak time was like 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. People came home, took showers, cooked and things like that, where the peak around the rest of the country was much different. So there were some great incentives, and I think the tracks were laid for the train to go on for the hot water program, because again, the utility could use a hot water tank as like a battery. Uh huh. Sure. That was, I think, the early genesis story of solar. Were you doing hot water at first then? No, but I work with a lot of those guys, helping them disconnect, reconnects, or doing work with them. But yeah, in the early days, it wasn't very popular because it was very expensive. I mean, to do a residential turnkey solar system in Hawaii was probably like eight dollars per watt. If you did battery, it could have been like 12. So in the early days, you know, there was probably one person on every island. I was probably the one on Oahu and so forth. And I was grateful because people trusted me and I was able to build my brand and try to help people. And across from my office in Kailua on Oahu, which is on the eastern side of the island, I was able to get together with a, a pretty wealthy person that we put a 9.3 kilowatt system on the library in Kailua because... At the time, that metering was capped at 10 kilowatts. And so I spent a lot of time at the legislature trying to help craft laws with the Solar Energy Association in Hawaii. So I became very involved, you know, with the governor's office and meeting the governor and trying to really foster a shift. And I think at the, time, the utility didn't really think it was a big deal because not people were doing it. Yeah. And so back then, like 10 kilowatts was huge, right? I mean, 
And then what are you charging? Like over $10 a watt was probably the going rate for something like that. So hundred thousand dollars plus. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, like, yeah. And, and it was like so important. The governor has to get involved <laughs> for a yeah, well, system. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It started, I think with public policy, right? So if anybody that's ever been, spent some time at a legislature you know, in Hawaii, we have three energy committees on the house and Senate, but really it's always ways and means and finance, right? The money people, you spend a lot of time educating. And then at the city and county level, you have to educate the inspectors and building departments and engineers. So it was a tremendous amount of education that had to happen. So it just took a lot of time. And I think it was really well worth it because to see, again, what's flourished as a result of that, back to your numbers of gigawatts and terawatts, um, I think it's really exciting. Oh, yeah. Yeah, totally. So you sold your company, you said, was it 20 years ago? Was it to... It was 2007. 2007. So 15 years ago, I guess. Yep. And um, and so after that, did you start another company? Did you work for that company? Yeah. So St. Edison um, came to Hawaii and again, they started extending their reach all around the globe. You know, we would set up offices. They had offices in Spain and Italy and wherever the incentives were, we were kind of getting ahead of that, like kind of like Navy SEALs descending into a marketplace. Huh. And then about a year after the acquisition, a little bit longer than that, they decided to plot of the market there's some new changes in the leadership of the company. That was after um, Jigger sold it, you mean? Yeah, well, again, I'll give a little more of that context. So back to the world financial crisis, right? A lot of things changed. I mean, uh-huh. with medicine, because, you know, one of the things that people, they go back and Google or research is that back then, a lot of it was based upon tax equity. And after the world financial crisis, a lot of these, you know, Morgan Stanley's and Goldman Sachs didn't really have a lot of appetite for tax equity. Yeah, if you're not making any money, you don't have to pay taxes. Correct. And I think the system still needs to be tweaked. And I feel like the tax credit's really made for the one half of the top 1% of our society, but that's not the topic we can share for another day. Mm-hmm. So after they pulled out of the market, I started this company, SunHedge, which was just basically doing consulting work. And people would say, Keith, how did you grow and build and scale and sell a business? And then, so that's what I started doing on October 22nd of 2008. And that's what I'm doing since then. So I've been doing... Essentially consulting, I also did a brief stint at a large publicly traded uh, utility company last year, uh, which was really great. I got to learn a bunch of things and understood the way they looked at the marketplace and their resource base and their strategy. So a lot of it was kind of stuff that I already knew, but they did it on scale. Mm-hmm. That's great, great. So you had Sun Hedge and then in between there and starting your heat spring class, which I noticed that I did get an email not too long ago that said it was heat spring was celebrating your 10th anniversary for the solar MBA class, which is pretty good. I guess I'll be celebrating my 10th anniversary in two years. So I think I've been with heat spring for eight years. It's been pretty great. I remember Brian called me up one time and he was telling me about this online training thing. And I was like, well, can I live on my sailboat and sail around the world and do this? And he said, yeah. And so I said, sign me up. It's been great ever since. It's been a great couple of guys to work for there. What's good for one is good for all. Sort of like musketeers, all for one, one for all. I think that's the saying. And so that's just kind of the way that they set it up. And I think they like to get people that are experts and write books. And so I noticed that you've also written some books and they're on your website. And so you want to just mention your website, maybe talk about your books? Yeah, the website is sunhedge, hedge like hedge fund.com. Spell that because make sure there's not some gardeners that like to trim hedges and, and whatever people will get mixed up. So, yeah, it's S U N H E D G E. Uh-huh. So I realize we wanted to kind of proverbially or metaphorically is, you know, hedge energy consumption with the sun, right? So, uh-huh. there was a the connect there. But yeah, so I think it was in 2012, I published a book called Solar Success Principles, How to Make a Difference in a Fortune in This Economy, in the New Green Economy. And it was more like, I would say, a roadmap for, you know, again, when people ask, how did you do this? And it was really about systems and processes and letting those do the work. And that's how I think people can grow their small solar companies and really kind of measuring things, you know, like having good metrics. To me, that was really critical to say, look, it's not about how many million did in sales, but how much money did you get to keep and how do you incentivize the right behaviors within your organization and track things. And our company, just to rewind, which was part of the foundation for that book was we didn't just do solar. You know, we were a service company, right? We were there to serve the community, whether it was Department of Defense and a top secret is set up, whether it was commercial, whether it was residential, 
whether somebody called and something didn't work. Again, we were a service focus. So you were working for the Department of Defense? Yeah, we did some projects. Yeah. Tell me some secrets. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that like Pythagoras, the famous Greek guy, he was taking down Roman ships with a bunch of mirrors. Was it something <laughs> like that? It wasn't that sinister, but it was more like looking at, you know. You're the, not after the Romans. Okay, then what, yeah. who, who are you after? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the Department of Defense, I think they really are looking forward, right? I mean, it wasn't a DARPA project per se, but it was trying to figure out a lot of things, you know, like how do they have, you know, resiliency? And I think, again, much of their credit in Hawaii, they were very much on the forefront. And for people that don't know in Hawaii, like a lot of the military base have their own grids. And again, thinking like the Department of Defense, they want to have multiple layers of protection and support. And, you know, it's the kind of bullion agile. If this goes wrong, if the grid goes down, how do we maintain, right, our infrastructure? And then how do we take those ideas and how do we deploy them outside of, you know, the base onto the theater, right? So, yeah, yeah I guess, I mean, you, you look back to World War II and all that and Pearl Harbor and the middle of the Pacific, it is a pretty strategic place. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think uh, statistically, one out of every 10 people on the island of Oahu has some connection to the Department of Defense. So if there's 100,000 people, that's 10,000 people in yeah. some role or another. So yeah, it's a very support, logistics, and strategic location. Yeah, and then like Tom Cruise was in the military then or something in World War II, I think. And I saw a movie about that. I figured it was probably true, right? No. <laughs> there's been a few movies that are made like recreating Pearl Harbor, but mm -hmm. I think it's again strategic. And that's why even before you and I were probably on the planet, um, yeah. they wanted to have that placed as a strategic outpost. Yeah. A day in infamy. I, that is kind of interesting. I noticed that once in a while over the years, I've been getting invitations to some defense conference where they want solar people there. I just thought that was kind of interesting. I guess there is a lot of defense applications for solar, like they're all the fuel convoys in Afghanistan and they were saving lives by just running things off of solar energy instead of diesel generators. So there's just lots of great applications for solar. Actually, I interviewed somebody that was from a company and wrote an article about it called Solar In, and they're looking at doing space-based solar power. And everybody's worried that they're going to learn how to microwave people down here on earth, but it's kind of interesting. But the guy was saying, no, if we wanted to hurt people on earth, we'd use a laser instead. Anyway, I guess we should get a little bit more serious here. Well, that would be serious if it would happen. <laughs> and so maybe it'd be interesting to know a little bit more about your class, because that's kind of cool. It's like a solar MBA. And I mean, you get, people are probably like blowing those certificates up and hanging them high on their wall. It's kind of neat. It's you and it's Chris Lord is the attorney. So, and I was even thinking too, that maybe what we should do at some point is make a package deal for people that want to just have like the full solar experience and they could sign up for both of our classes at once and get some kind of a discount or something that would be kind of neat to do something like that. Let's just like kind of get to know about your class, like a little bit more about what like you do and you help people. And there's like ways that people will do all this kind of stuff. And so there's a lot of people in the solar industry that are in a lot of different niches. And so you have people like that I'm dealing with are the real technical people. And I know that you know a lot of technical stuff also, but you're dealing with people that are on the business side of stuff. So you said words like CapEx and a lot of the technical people don't know what that means. And so, you, you know, you got MBA, maybe just kind of tell us a little bit more about that and what's the class all about. And maybe everybody should just sign up for it and find out what it's all about that way. Yeah, that's a great question. I think quite often I come from a technical background by training as well, but I think one of the things that I or you, we always kind of embrace is constant learning, right? And being open. And again, back to Jigger, you know, we would start in the early days in 2002, sending spreadsheets back and forth and understanding the idea of, you know, tax credits and depreciation and using tax equity and getting into all that. It was kind of born into my blood early, like 20 years ago. And here's somebody that's technical, right? That didn't have that, what we would characterize as education. And I think, again, today, one of the greatest things about learning online and training online and teaching online is that you democratize knowledge, right? And then it just comes down to someone just being curious and putting in the time. So when I approach Chris and we can all do an interview together and he'll tell you that, and I think he even did recently, you know, he was not really ready to teach online because of, again, even his own formal training through law school. 
So, and again, a lot of times it can be intimidating for people that just know Ohm's law per se, like me, mm-hmm. that said, okay, I want to know a different kind of law, right? Like how do these sophisticated financial instruments work just like how a battery and inverter work? So to me, they're just vehicles, right? Mm-hmm. For either delivering electrons or delivering money. So as I had to learn about this stuff, I got really deeply involved in contracts. And then when you sell your company, you understand about even more things, right? So, you know, when I sat down with Chris to talk about this, you know, like create an open forum, people can ask any question. And we've all been told before, there are no dumb questions. And that's really true. And every time, you know, in my own life, that when I think about people asking me a question about solar, that we might consider even you and I, that's what we would consider as very fundamental, we realize people haven't been exposed to those things. So, you know, I would tell everybody that's watching this or listening is don't be afraid to go learn something because you can learn it, whether it's structured finance, whether it's Excel, understanding the terms and conditions in a contract. So, you know, having said that, that's what Chris and I did. We set out to say, okay, how can we make this simple for people? So, you know, whether it be trying to do an RFP and why did I create that aspect of the course? Because a lot of times in the industry, if you're a solar developer, you respond to RFPs. Well, Me being on the other side of the table, representing an owner, having been in the business, but on both sides of the table, what I set out to do in in one aspect of the course was say, look, even if you don't do an RFP and you're going to take this class, you need to understand if you watch these lessons and these lectures and you do the assignment and you respond to the assignment, it's going to do something really important for you and for your business or for your skill set. It's going to allow you to reverse engineer what an owner is thinking when they're putting out a solicitation first thing. The second thing, it's going to allow you to actually make your proposal stronger because when you're out in the marketplace, if you know that these can be asked of you anyway, you can either avoid this and not put this into your contract, your proposal, or answer those questions that are in your client's or your prospective client's mind ahead of time. So it'll make your company stronger, it'll build your brand, and it'll set expectations of your client about how you operate. And it's also going to attract better people to your company to execute on those goals and those dreams and those visions of what your customer wants. So, I mean, that's just one slice of it, but, you know, we go through the whole development process. So the week number one, here's a simple spreadsheet, which is like a Gantt chart. So whether you're doing a commercial rooftop project or you're doing stuff for a small residential developer that has like a DR Horton, or you're doing a 50 megawatt or five megawatt project, some of these categories don't matter, but you need to identify who are the people that do this work in your company, whether inside or outside, what are the processes, and then what are the timelines, right? Because the solar development process on utility scale can take years, not months. So it's really about getting people tuned into processes. And again, I'm very process oriented and I like to be creative, but I think if you get the foundation process things down, then you can make more time to be creative. So there's times when, you know, you got to learn to do the hard stuff first, which is setting up these systems in an organization, which is again, what I did in my own company, even though people didn't really like that, I ended up attracting the right people to my company that understood processes and procedures. And other ones that didn't like that, I hopefully I helped them get a job somewhere else. And again, these same fundamentals apply. And as well as the financing side. So if you're not really good at Excel, Chris does a great job going through some Excel stuff and some modeling. And we give them a template. Here's a template that Chris and I have used for decades, and you can use it too. And we've edited, applied it to battery storage over time. But again, it's really getting these foundational principles in alignment with who you are, who your team is. And then you can continue to execute on those things. So you give out like Excel spreadsheet that you guys have developed over a decade, at least something like that. Usually from what I've seen, people hold pretty tight onto those things. So that's unusual for you to be so giving with your spreadsheet. So that's pretty cool. That might be worth the price of the whole class. I know that I've like worked with some people and they just like, they really don't want you to share it. And they're just NDAs and all that kind of stuff. So that's pretty cool that you guys let people check out your spreadsheet. So the type of people that take your class, so like a lot of times I think about this kind of thing, I'm thinking like developing big, huge solar farms and somebody goes out there and they're like, I want to develop 10 megawatts, 100 megawatts, you know, two megawatts, that's too small for me. Maybe it wouldn't have been too small 20 years ago, but now it would be considered kind of small by a lot of these developers. Even 10 megawatts would be considered kind of small. So are you seeing the people that are in your classes being the ones that are working with these big, huge projects, or are you seeing other times just maybe like smaller companies that are just some solar installer company that's just wants to, you know, become 
a better solar installer company, maybe like an electrician company that's doing solar that wants to just figure out how all the financing's working? Or is it like, like a combination of both of those things, people that are making policy? What kind of people are in your classes? That's a great question. And, and I think, yeah, a lot of times people would be uh, like kind of intimidated, like this is way above their pay grade or their experience mm -hmm. level. I mean, I can tell you in the last decade, we've literally had people from Wall Street, you know, the private equity, tax equity, insurance people, that kind of genre. We've also had the people that are the one man in the one truck. And mm -hmm. we've had people that are engineers, people that are scientists, people that are salespeople, people that are doing business development on the utility scale down to, you know, again, small projects. We have people that work to other companies that want to improve their skill set. So I think that the thing that Chris and I always try to encourage is don't be intimidated by any of it because everybody can learn this stuff. So there are no barriers to entry. As an example, as the recording of this call with you and I right now in this podcast and this video is that we have people right now that are in there that are in the smaller category. And sometimes they might have some land or they know a farmer or their family has a farm somewhere. Or they're coming from another industry and they're saying, I'm going to make this investment in myself so I can take my skills that are transferable from, let's just say, oil and gas and hit the ground running really quickly. And we've had a lot of people that have done that and actually gotten jobs relatively quickly by taking the class because they can speak the language and they'll take their baby project management skills from wherever they were from different industry and be able to apply them and apply the systems and processes. So it applies to everybody. And even though that somebody might be saying today, I'm not really interested in a 50 megawatt, 10 megawatt, but maybe they can do a two megawatt project on their small farm where they live. Or, you know, they're going to take the skills that they'll learn that might be, you know, they're not ready for them today, but they're going to say, you know what, in six months, you know, Keith or Chris, I'm going to apply this stuff. So I think for them, it's just getting perspective because one of the things that doesn't get talked a lot about in our industry is this success fail ratio meaning people will just jump in and they won't take a course. They won't get some perspective from people that have suffered before them. They'll go out and try. They'll spend a whole year and waste hundreds of hours, maybe thousands of hours and have no results because they don't understand land acquisition. They understand financial modeling. They don't understand what an investor's hurdle rate is, meaning the rate that they want to get for the return on their money that they invest. They understand the RFP process. They don't understand how to run their company. They don't understand project management. That's not their fault. They just haven't been exposed to it. So by people taking the class, what they do is they short circuit all that. And then again, they're going to know what to look out for. They're going to have a checklist so that they'll know they can make a small investment in a course and say, you know, at the end of the six weeks or two months, I don't really want to be in this business. Or conversely, they're going to say, you know what, I know the people I need to get to build or to build my team to do this effectively, successfully, where they can not just make money, but make a difference. Mm -hmm. So I think people need to look at when they take a class like this. They need to look at what's the end goal and then work backwards. Yeah. I've seen a lot of people over the years even take my classes and they're like, they come in, they go, I, I need to learn about solar. I've got this, you know, 10 acres and it's just perfect for solar. And that's what I'm here for. And then I get to break the bad news to them that there's a lot more to it. You need to have transmission. You need to even have somebody that's going to buy your electricity. The utility isn't always going to buy your electricity. It depends on where you are. And there's so many different factors. So I'm sure you probably get all into that in your class. And so it's like, even if somebody just doesn't, like you were saying, waste thousands of hours trying to develop some project that would never be developed. I've kind of thought too, that there's probably for every project that is developed, there's probably multiple projects that somebody spent lots of money on that didn't get developed. So it takes people with deep pockets that can try to develop a whole bunch of projects at once, usually to make things that work. I did get to see one thing that was kind of interesting. There was this guy out in England. He helped me get a class. I taught a class over in the Middle East. And anyway, I was on my way and I had a like a half a day stopover in England. And he took me to this thing that he developed on this water treatment reservoir, I guess you could call it. And it was called the QE2. At first, I thought he was going to take me to a ship. <laughs> and it was just this big old reservoir, and he floated six megawatts on it. It was pretty cool. But just to hear the guy's story about how he developed it, and it just sounded like he was taking so many risks, and he was successful. So he was pretty good at it. And he had to figure out how to get the electricity from here to there, and the transformers, and how to float it out there. And I think, actually, the biggest problem he was having was with bird poop. <laughs> 
<laughs> because when you float something, the birds like to like sit on the edge and catch the fish that are hiding out underneath the solar. So, so you've probably seen a million stories about, you know, that people that were and weren't successful in developing a solar project. And that's really good information that you're teaching there to figuring out how to develop these projects, where to get the financing. I know a lot of people too, that it's just been years, haven't even made a dollar doing this kind of stuff. So it's one of those things that you got to be able to go for a while without making money and then you can hit the jackpot. Yeah, it's a long road. And I think what happens is I think people get enamored with like press releases. They'll see a project and there'll be a big splash about it and everyone's really excited and they don't know what the Genesis story to get to that point, right? Mm-hmm. A ribbon cutting or moving some dirt and uh, environmental things, you know, dealing with the uh, Army Corps of Engineers as an example and understanding shading, understanding interconnection. You could be in a queue for a while making these upfront payments and then you know your position could be destroyed. Public policy changes. And that's why in general, we try to tell people in the class, you know, partner with somebody, like if you're really good in business development, partner with an engineering firm, for an engineering firm, partner with somebody who understands public policy. And it takes a village. And even back to Sun Edison days, I mean, we had attorneys in there, we had land people. I mean, this is, you know, Large scale solar is like doing development, like for a subdivision for housing, right? You need to go through all these layers of permitting and proof of concept. And I've sat in so many different, you know, meetings and town meetings in Hawaii trying to approve a little, you know, solar farm. It could be a 500 kilowatts and getting community buy in. And it's just very painful, you know, depending upon your market. I mean, if you're in California, there's even more restrictions. It could be like an owl that burrows into the ground or it could be a floodplain survey. I mean, the list goes on and on. So I'm really a big fan of teamwork. So if you could find somebody that's, you know, maybe you have the money and they have the talent is that you work together like a joint venture. And a lot of times that is successful because everybody brings their specific talent in there. And again, by taking this class, you're going to say, okay, where am I in the value chain and where can I create value? Where can I learn? And maybe you might go apprentice under a company, so to speak, and learn something or whatever the thing is that you're curious about. But I think the other thing, which also should be really emphasized, is I'm a really big fan of this cross-functional education. So I'm not a lawyer, but I know a lot of legal stuff, right? And even when you sell your company, you end up really becoming like a, a junior yeah, attorney, right? Yeah, so, like you know way more about renewable energy law than a personal injury attorney. So just because somebody has an attorney degree doesn't know they know anything about the subject that you're working on. So correct. probably wouldn't be able to help out somebody in a car accident. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so yeah, we all become proverbial specialists. And like too, you've been working on this for a lot longer than somebody even goes to law school. Yeah. So it just like you specialize and that's just kind of the way it is. It's just like a lot of people didn't even finish their degrees, you know, like some of these top billionaires in the world that we won't mention their names, you know, didn't get that degree. They're a bunch of dropouts. <laughs> So, but, you know, you get the school of hard knocks, specializing, working in your thing. In fact, I mean, I noticed that from my myself, what I do is like, shoot, I study as hard as I did in college every day. I've got up at five this morning and put in some hours, you know, going through the NEC, answering questions for my classes. One question I answered in my class took me an hour to answer it. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's like you can study and learn a lot of stuff, not even going to college. I think that's what a lot of people are doing these days. And they're kind of proving that it's like what you know and how useful you are doesn't really depend on having that bachelor's degree or whatever it is. Although like, you know, bachelor degrees are great and college is a lot of fun. I'm not ever going to recommend against going to college. I hope all my kids go to college and finish and get like, you know, lots of advanced degrees. But a lot of times too, with just like taking these classes, like what we're teaching and specializing you could learn more useful information in a matter of weeks than you might learn in four years, you know, learning about really cool stuff like evolution and biology and geology and English. is That's always a good one. <laughs> but it's good to combine all these things together. And I think, though, too, about learning is just like learning how to learn is a really hard part. Like I've noticed that I have some students that just don't know how to learn. That's one of the good things that college teaches people. But also another way to learn is just to get out there and just like teach yourself, get on there and to work hard at it and not to get too distracted. I remember when I was in college, one of the books that helped me the most was like 
can't remember the exact name of it. It was like how to study. <laughs> and so some of the things about how to study was just to like sit down there and learn it. You know, I think a lot of times too, people think that multitasking is this great thing, but multitasking just makes you distracted. And so like, even this morning I was catching myself like, oh, I just forgot about some email. And I was like, whoa, no, go back. You got to finish what you're doing first. You know, I do have a little place where I can like write a note, do this. So I don't forget it, but getting too distracted and being all over the place doesn't help very much, but getting on our classes, I know at least my classes. So I have some classes that are 18 hours and some of that are 40 hours. And I'm sure that some people finish them in the minimum amount of time, but then other people will spend probably five times the amount of time working in that class, just studying all the material. So one of the things too, I know with all my classes is people have a whole year's access to all the material. How does your classes work with as far as that goes? Yeah, so, uh, but I want to touch on something you said, which I think is really important for your listeners, and I'll just equally support the idea of continuous learning. And then I think, you know, what you're kind of alluding to is just constantly building your critical thinking skills and being skeptical of what you think you know, and just constant improvement. Like you said, you were spending about an hour trying to make time to respond to a student's question, right, to the code, right? So I think it's those kind of skills that we want to imbue with everybody is, you know, how do we get them to think better and think, be more clear thinkers and be more one-pointed and like you're saying, being focused versus being distracted. And I think that's a whole dopamine conversation for the next call we have. But, but I think to your point, you know, in, in our MBA class in particular is we put this on for six weeks as we'll add a seventh week if we know students are falling behind and they like your class, they have access to it for a whole year. And we want to get engagement. And again, people can start the class. Like, let's say the class starts, like we just were in like week three of this class right now. But if people saw this class advertised in December or in any month, you know, two or three months before the class physically starts, they can take the class. It's one of the nice things about a heat spring is that the door is always open to learn. Now, for us in our particular setup, what we learned when we first started the class, a little bit of history is that before you know Zoom and all this stuff became easy, and I think before infrastructure got strong, meaning where people could do web video just like you and I are doing today, we would use audio, right? So we had like a free conference call.com number, people would call in, and like even three years ago when I was living in Southeast Asia, when I was in Colombia, I would just call in. And then we would record the calls, so if people missed the calls, they could listen to them again. And now we do the same concept with the video calls, right? So. We're kind of building our own audio and video library as well of, you know, the discussion, which I think is also important, you know, and, and for you and for your classes or even some other class have a heat spring, there may be a digital, right? There's just comments. So either way, you know, I, I'm okay. Whatever way you want to learn, if you're better auditory, if you're better visual and auditory, or if you're better reading, whatever works for you to build your skill set and build your talent, your knowledge base, you can kind of go back and recall that stuff. And again, with what you just said is that, you know, HeatSpring gives people access to the stuff for a year. So I really believe, you know, if people are interested in taking the class, and again, they might take the class a second time. They might say, you know, the class was great, but I wasn't ready for this part. And again, we have all these visual lectures, you know, you can look over our shoulder, watch me do a spreadsheet, watch Chris do a spreadsheet, watch me kind of go through a contract, watch Chris go through a contract, or whatever these tools that people want to add to their repertoire they keep watching them over and over and over again. And to me, it's just like exercise. You keep doing the same thing. You're going to build your muscle. So I always encourage all the students to keep watching, watch it again, post questions. Don't be shy. And hopefully that on the Fridays that we have a live call that they can participate or when they post, when we post that if people miss the class or miss that call because of their work or whatever's going on in their lives, that they can go back and watch it. And again, still post questions to what we recorded because we want people to feel fulfilled at the end and that they've learned something. And to me, that's the most important thing is, you know, again, building that skill foundation where, again, you're multifaceted and you understand in different markets, like maybe you're in the solo business in California, but you really want to go to Texas or Massachusetts or any state. And so how do, by having that dialogue and that discussion within our class where you can actually say, hey, look, I've just learned I don't want to go to Florida. I don't want to go to Kansas because the market's not ready yet. And you kind of get that through this aspect of heat spending, which is community. And I'm sure you get that a lot with even your classes. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I noticed that like, for example, one of the things is when I was in my earlier days getting involved in solar, I took a class at the time it was called the NABSEP entry level exam. And it was just a Saturday community college class. And I was just like, I'm going to dive deep into this thing. 
even though we met for, I don't know if it was like six hours on a Saturday once a week for six or eight weeks, something like that. I went home and I studied like Elon Musk working hours. I was studying like a hundred hours a week. I remember I was like eating cans of beans and I had a family member had a boat that was up on dry dock and I would just go in there and just like read and study. And that's pretty much all I would do. You know, it's like, I was kind of switching careers and things like that. I got a ton out of that. Do you remember Jim Dunlop's book? Mm -hmm. It was called Photovoltaic Systems. And it's a book that had like a real good beginner stuff, but also had really good advanced stuff. And sometimes it'd be on the same page. And so I just went from the beginning of that book. And sometimes I'd spend a day on a page, <laughs> you know, if it was a hard enough page. And I wouldn't turn the page until I totally understood the page before it. And then pretty soon I was teaching classes. <laughs> You know, just like people need to take the time out to study it. It's like education is pretty much the only thing that people can't steal from you. So like I was mentioning personal injury attorneys, you could be a millionaire. Somebody could cut in front of you and get paralyzed. And it was all their fault because they cut in front of you. But according to the laws, whoever's coming from behind is the one that's at fault. And your insurance only goes up to a million and they get awarded $5 million because they had a good personal injury attorney that got a good percentage of that money. And so all of a sudden you're broke. And the only thing you have left is your education. <laughs> I just can't emphasize enough how important it is to have an education. Plus it just kind of feels good to know stuff, you know? So everybody out there, get educated. <laughs> And also apply it. I think the analogy is like, you know, we do analysis paralysis sometimes where people feel I'm not good enough. I know this stuff. I took a class and how do I apply it? So I would encourage everybody that's think about taking any class uh, is to, you know, like you just did when you're in the boat, you would read a section, you would kind of apply yourself and also you become a teacher. So don't be intimidated by the material or you think that you cannot do this just like we're sitting here right now doing this class. It's really a class right now, Sean, right? I mean, talking about our history and how we got to where, where we got to because we took some information, we applied it. And I think the first or second call you and I had over the phone, I'd mentioned to you that uh, when the first class I took a long time ago, I drove down and we did some classroom training with a three-ring binder. And then I went out to a physical site and we actually did a free installation for somebody. And that was kind of the catalyst to say, okay, I can do this too. So for people that are watching this today, you know, if you're doing an app class, you've taken one of Sean's classes and you're not sure, go apply at that company that's doing solar, right? If you're maybe an electrician or whatever your vocation is, or wherever you were yesterday, that doesn't matter about who you can be today and who you want to be tomorrow. So take Sean's class, learn about NAPSEF, become certified, maintain your certification, and then go out and either start your own company, or go work for a company. Like, don't be afraid to go try and you know fail moving forward and that's really what it's all about i mean when solar was in hawaii there was very few resources back in 98 99 i would go down to the supply house there was a great guy there that's no longer on the planet i learned a lot from him but i would just draw stuff out and i would go look at the spec sheets from a solar panel manufacturer or a grid tied inverter or off-grid inverter and i would draw it out and think about the amperages like what sean just said i would go to the natural electrical code and figure out what the wire size was and I would also eat my own dog food. What uh, I didn't share yet is that when I first moved to Hawaii, I had this little apartment, this little studio apartment, a block from the beach. And I asked the people, hey, is it okay if I put an inverter on and some batteries? And I bought a Trace 5548, which is a 5,500 watt inverter at 48 volts. I bought four Concord AGM absorbed glass mat batteries that were 8Ds. These things were probably weighed more than I did with two handles. I put in a C40 charge controller. I put in a meter. And I put up four, I'm going to really date myself by saying this, SP, uh, Siemens Solar, 75 watt solar modules. So I wanted to really walk the talk and live with it. And the people below me, they were not really interested in solar energy, but they were kind of being humored by me, I guess. I really yeah. wanted to kind of live it and understand it, right? So if someone's listened to this today, you know, go out and get a couple solar panels, you know, put it on a vehicle, put it on your shed, put it on your apartment, put it on your yard. And go play with it and go live it, even on a boat. You know, in Hawaii, there's many people have done some boat work, right? Where people are really living it. They're crossing the Pacific. They're going to Tahiti. They're going to Oregon from Hawaii, right? And so they're living it. So, you know, go out and get the components. Go play with it. And then you kind of really breathe it. And then you'll understand what doesn't work, what works. You'll understand sun angle. 
understand when it's cloudy out, your batteries aren't going to work, can't run your refrigerator. I think these are also important distinctions that are really kind of elevate you in the industry. So another thing that I watched a video that you were doing was you tricked out an ambulance and you put solar on it and batteries and it looked pretty nice. And I think you have a class on that at Heat Spring, right? Or- yeah, that was something that just happened last year. I think, you know, last year, um, we're almost approaching two years of COVID, right? And a lot of people have been like restless and you know, looking for something to do. You know, they just mm-hmm. don't want to look out the window every day. So a little rewind before I spent a year in Southeast Asia, right before COVID, I thought, you know, I might do something like this because I like to travel and meet new people and experience new cultures. And I decided to put the whole, you know, building a vehicle and traipsing around, I think before it was even called van life. I did that over Southeast Asia across, you know, eight countries. But so again, coming back to America, all of a sudden things again shut down. And I said, okay, what can I do? It'd be really exciting. And people had, you know, the sprinter vans, the ones that we would normally see roaming around and going to national parks and things like that. So I wanted to find something different. So I said, what can I find that's really durable, that's built really well, that's unusual? So I went out and I bought a, uh, an ambulance and it was a used ambulance. And I said, okay, I'm just going to figure this out. And again, with my maybe technical background, business background, experience, I said, I'm going to do this. So I bought an ambulance and I built most of it in the Home Depot parking lot because I can go in and out and get parts. I mean, ambulances are pretty tall. You can fit them in your driveway. Well, in your garage, you might be able to fit them in your driveway. But, you know, it was a kind of process of discovery. You know, how can I... Neat idea, yeah. Yeah, how can I take something that was nothing, that was really designed for the application and go for it. So I took out a pen and a pad and some blue tape and some cardboard and made some kind of AutoCAD and started thinking about it. And it gave me a really great project to kind of, again, be very one pointed and not being tuning out the news, but tuning into like, how could I make a difference? And how could I pay homage and honor first responders and doctors and all the people involved with maintaining these vehicles. And, and this was a children's ambulance. I had a lot of sentimental things for anybody that's ever had families in the back of an ambulance and decided to do that. So I put solar on it. I put batteries and inverter. I put a sofa bed, I put a real AC refrigerator, I made a little YouTube channel about that to kind of educate people that are just thinking about it. I walked through the reasons why I chose the wire I did. And actually this weekend, I had a big YouTube channel uh, approach me last year and said, you know, we'd love to do a story on you. And they just published it actually Saturday and it got a lot of positive oh, great. How, so, how do people find out, like, where can they go to, like, what's the link? YouTube channel I just started actually December 1st. It's called Daily Destinations with an S. The reason why I chose that is because every day, you know, just like for you and I, Sean, and for people who are watching this, is that we have these really big goals. I want to achieve all this in a day, and you really can't. So that's why I'm all about plural, like make incremental steps to learn the code, to learn NABSEF, to whatever it is you're trying to learn and apply yourself because you know, I think learning is incremental and it's reflective. So I made that YouTube channel and you know, I was talking to Heat Spring and I said, you know, I just want to show this to you guys. And I said, would you interested in making a little tiny home course? And that's great, you know, because they have a huge audience and people in the solar business also, which is another thing, which I think we should really touch upon is that it's really great that solar has really been democratized and a lot of people are doing solar, but a lot of the clients that I have, they're in this space. They're like, they're not really making a lot of money. So I tell people all the time, well, if you want to have a fun project that you can do, if you have a warehouse, you already have a solar company, go find a school bus, go find a, an ambulance, go find whatever the vehicle is and go make a little tiny home on wheels. And you can take it on journeys or you can actually create your own, you know, wheel estate investment, right? And right. make your own and then you maybe you can buy them, you can flip them like people flip houses. So the idea of this course is to say, you know, I'm going to show you kind of what I would look over my shoulder. I'm going to show you the economics, the math, the, how many hours it takes to do things. And then again, the business case for it. I think, you know, it's the course is live now, but if people are thinking about it and you want to check it out, I offer a money back guarantee because I really believe in what I do. So you can go check out the course on Heat Spring. It's kind of what we're calling a tiny home boot camp, where I'm going to show you again the electrical, the plumbing, and then again the business case for it if you want to get into the business. I think it's great. And I think when you look around the country today, there's a shortage of housing. People love to travel and they want to be nomadic. And this is a great way to kind of do both of those things. So, I kind of, again, look over my shoulder what I did and how I did it and how you can do it too. Great. So anybody could just go to Heat Spring and then look for Keith Cronin and then see all your classes. And then it's the Tiny Home Boot Camp. Yes. Or yeah. you probably could just go to a search engine and just go like Heat Spring, Tiny Home or, you know. 
How about like other ways to find you? So we had the sunhedge.com. That's a good way to find you. And also has information about your consulting there. And so that's some important stuff to be able to get some consulting so you don't waste a ton of money trying to do something on your own that you're just not an expert at. And so what other classes do you have out there that you're doing? Well, yeah. And even on my own website, I have some classes, but I really think that, you know, I try to look at every company organically. And again, when people start a company out of frustration or just curiosity, or you're maybe born with entrepreneurial trait where you want to kind of just go for it. But I think, you know, business owners have sometimes part technical skill, part sales skill, let's just say. So they're either mechanical, electrical, or their business development, right? And sometimes as we look at the industry or we look at any company, right, in general, from a hierarchical point of view. But I think entrepreneurs have both, right? You need to be front facing, right? You're the face of the company. And if you're just starting out, you hang your shingle out and you say, you know, I have this technical skill, I'm starting a company, or I have this, you know, idea and I want to birth and I want to bring people on board. So on HeatSpring, as well as my own website, I teach people marketing skills, how to get the name out, how to write copy, you know, how to create messages that work for people. Again, the metric skills. So like, I really think in our business, which doesn't get talked a lot about is back to the Excel stuff is understanding what gross margin is, understanding what overhead is, understanding what real profit is, net profit versus gross profit, understanding assets and depreciating the assets, understanding if you send somebody out to do an installation today, what percentage efficient are they? If you have a service business, is that 75, 80% efficient or is it 50% efficient because they're driving job to job on the operations and maintenance? And again, back to our Hawaii story, you know, I did this in my own company. So we used to have flat rate price books. So if someone called and said, hey, something doesn't work, whether it's a city in County of Honolulu, whether it was a commercial business or somebody at home, we can actually give them a price on the spot and do the work on the spot. So we had trucks that were numbered and lettered. Everything was organized. So we took a lot of the foundational framework from like a car dealership where you pull up and said, okay, something about my transmission, my air conditioning, they'd be able to give you a price on the spot because they would measure the hours to do a project into their hourly rate. And they coalesce that to create a flat rate price book really, which is what happens at, you know, car dealerships for repairs. And so we apply that to our own business. So I show people again, how, if you want to be in the solar business that you create flat rate price books and you also create incentives. So if you have installation teams out there, that you create a small percentage of the project and you assign that to the team so that if you want to get jobs done that are safe, get jobs that are done on time and on budget and you reward for the right behavior so that you can manage the expectation of your client, you get jobs done safely, profitably. And again, you, as a business owner, you can share in the pie. And I think that doesn't get talked a lot about. And ironically, just yesterday, I had this talk with one of our students in the MBA class and I kind of showed them the spreadsheet and how to do this and how to reward for this and setting expectations, setting agendas within your company and just making it very clear and getting buy-in from your team. And again, that's what worked at my own company, which I really believe the foundation where I was able to grow the business and scale it and sell it. And that's not why I grew the business, but I realized that if I don't have these systems in place, a process in place and buy-in and asking these questions of our team, then I'm doing the company a disservice People might just be there to get a paycheck, but I wanted people to be there to really be interested in making a difference in the community and also helping build the company. We help build them. Mm -hmm. I got an example for you. I've got a colleague or, you know, a guy that I know from the industry and he's smart. He knows what he's doing better than most anybody as far as the technical stuff goes and how to make things work and doing microgrids. And he's been at it for a long time, but his business is growing way faster than he can handle. He doesn't know if he's making or losing money, like you were saying, as far as like calculating all that kind of stuff. He's got a ton of people that are just mad at him. He's a nice guy, so he usually calms them down pretty well. But he's behind a lot of times, six months, even a year, stuff like that, because he's just too busy taking on too much business and is micromanaging things and all the things that you probably teach people how to avoid in your class. And I think that one of the things that he could do is if he just took a month off, crammed, studied all your stuff and followed your advice, he'd probably get it all figured out and be making tons more money. Like there's this one person I know of, the guy probably owes him like, I don't know, 50 or hundred grand and he just needs to invoice him. <laughs> and it just like, he's, I'm too busy. I'm too busy for everything. I'm too busy. I don't have, he's like up at midnight and up at six in the morning you know, on the phone and doing all this stuff. 
So it's just really important for people to get organized. I think one of the things, especially right now, is we're seeing there's such fast growth in this industry that people can't keep up with it. And I know that one of the things that they've said just in general for businesses is the hardest thing to overcome is growing too fast. And so I see a lot of people that just can't keep up with the growth. Those are a lot of people, though, that need to get some good solar MBA advice <laughs> to figure out how to run their businesses, get some consulting, to get organized, like you were saying. It sounds like you're good at getting people organized and all that kind of stuff. And then they can go make money, have some time with their family, and even have a family. <laughs> There's probably a lot of people out there that are too busy to have a family because they're just stressed out, pulling their hair out because they have too much business. And it's something that everybody has to deal with someday is figuring out like, which job should I turn down? Or, or maybe somebody has to double their prices instead of turning a job down. Maybe that's another way of dealing with it. I'm seeing all the companies, just like the big companies, the small companies, they can't keep up with the business. And that's another thing with me. It's like, I mean, I have a California contractor's license and all this kind of stuff. But people call me all the time and it's just like, I can't take this business. I'm already busy enough. And so instead of me trying to wear myself too thin, I just have to turn it down or, you know, send it somewhere else. And I've known a lot of other people too. I think even Brian at Heatspring was saying that he got his friend's company to do his installation on his house. But then he's got some other friends that want installations. And he tells the guy, my friends have got some business and you're my friend too. So let's get this going. And they're like, I'm too busy. I can't do it. So at least they're being honest and not taking on too much. So do you got any good advice for these people that are just growing too fast? <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, I, I, was, I was touching upon earlier, but you're, it's a great invitation to allow me to expand on that is this basic idea of when you're first starting out your company, if you are in this position and you're watching this, is that the idea of, again, taking the time to develop the framework and the systems, right? I remember, again, I would get calls Monday through Sunday when I first started because I just didn't know. I had hired a, a girl from the solar supply house that did the bookkeeping there. She'd come by once a month and keep me organized because that was the early days of QuickBooks, right? But I'd realized very quickly that for me to be at the center of every decision at my company as it started to grow, it was fruitless. So that's when I started saying, okay, what is it that you do, Keith? You know, write that down and then put that in a binder. Mm -hmm. So we would make training videos at our company, how to use our software, how to dispatch people. All that was documented. Mm -hmm. So the real key is to grow a business and to grow it to scale and to do it efficiently and effectively is you have to delegate. And the only way you can delegate is by creating a system and creating a system of accountability. And the list goes on, whether it's your mm -hmm. accounting yeah. software, whether it's QuickBooks, whether it's how to use a tool, like you might think everybody's how to use this tool. Let's just show everybody how do we use this tool? How do you keep your vehicle organized? How do you make sales? How do you pay commissions? How do you do whatever? And as you start thinking about and the simple idea of we work 40 hours a week, let's say we work 50 hours a year, we take two weeks off, that's 2000 hours in a year. So out of those hours, if you're self-employed, you're probably only going to be able to work four hours a day doing actually something physical if you're just starting out as a small solar company. The other four are going to be spent administrating work and doing all sorts of things, marketing, looking at projects, fixing things you made mistakes on. So what happens? You get frustrated. Like, I'm going to do it all myself, like these people you're describing. And that's why they don't send out bills. That's why they fall behind. That's why they just hit a wall. They don't want to hire anybody because nobody can do the work better than them. That's fine. But they're probably going to be stuck in this having just a really expensive job for a very long time. And if that works for them, that's great. But for the companies that want to grow, that want to acknowledge as a leader that I don't want to know everything. I want to just do this thing, whatever that thing is, whatever lane they want to stay in. How do I hire my first bookkeeper? How do I hire the first person to answer the phone? How do I hire my first salesperson? How do I hire the first electrician, installer? So think about the things that you love to do that if somebody took that away from you, you'd be really upset and you keep doing that. Hmm. Or conversely, if you say, I'm really good at this, but I'm really curious about these other things, you know, then unfortunately delegate and let that go. I'll never forget that a really good friend of mine I've known for a very long time. I showed up to his property, I think in one of my vans. And he's like, Keith, what are you doing in that van? You should give that away. And it was kind of like my baby. I think we just bought it, right? It was another one we were adding to the fleet. And he's like, just let it go. And I'm like, but, 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 but. And he goes, no, 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 but, you know? And I almost like taking a, a hammer and just putting my first dent in the vehicle because I would see what would happen. 
I would, you know, I want to keep this thing pristine, but I had to let it go because of my own ego, which is the other part of the conversation is just let it go. If it gets scratched, it gets scratched. You know, if somebody breaks a tool on Saturday or Monday, who cares? I started letting go of the idea of control and saying, you know what, they're going to do things way better than me. I'm going to do other things way better than them, but in the really big picture, it doesn't matter because what really matters is the mission. Like, what is your goal? And for me, it was emancipating people from using oil and coal in Hawaii, right? And making a difference. So you have to think about, again, you know, start with the end and work backwards. And the goal that I had was much different, like doing public policy stuff. I love that. I love going, educating consumers, doing free workshops, right? And so to me, that was the higher priority. And it was probably less having a screwdriver in my hand. That doesn't mean I know how to, didn't know how to do that or I didn't want to do it, but I realized mine was a little bit of a different mindset or a different setting as I evolved as a person or as a human that I had loftier goals to want to make a difference and educate people. And so I think for people that are watching this or listening to this today is like, okay, you might be a really good blank, but what are your goals? Where do you want to be in one, three, five, seven, ten 10 years? And that was a question, an existential question I had to ask myself. And it was really to change public policy in Hawaii. It was to go from 10 kilowatts net metering to 100. Even that was a battle, right? It was important to say, look, I know you have solar hot water. How about getting solar electric? So it was these kind of things that I was inspired by. And those are my goals. And I was willing to let go of not having people do everything perfect or the way I would do it. In some ways, they did even better than I did it. But that was letting go of the control for a bigger picture. Great. Great. So let's see. So it looks like we've been up for about an hour now. Do you want to, should we wind it up or you got more topics you want to talk about? I can talk for hours about it. As you know, I mean, I'm really passionate about helping people and again, having them accelerate their goals and their desires. And it comes down to getting some education, taking an ABSEP course like you have, or taking one of my courses, but it's really about Pass on the knowledge, right? I mean, we've done that since probably we've all, you know, sat around a fire, right? Like a caveman came out of the cave. And how do we pass on that knowledge? And I think it's really important in our industry. It's important for the planet and all the inhabitants on it. So, you know, my parting thoughts, the people that are listening and watching today is to take Sean's class, take a heat spring class, take my class, hire Sean, hire Keith, fail more quickly, you know, stumble ahead. Don't be afraid. Ask questions, learn from others, and you'll be glad you did. Great. Thanks so much, Keith. It's great having you here. So I guess people can find you over at your website at SunHedge. I think there's all different places to go on sunhedge.com to go look for you. And we can also put that in the description of this podcast. And thanks for listening to Sean White's Solar and Energy Storage Podcast. To find out more, go to solarsean.com. And I'm not the Sean White in the Olympics. I'm that other Sean White. And uh, about once every four years, I have to make that differentiation. But now's about the time to do that. My hair is not red enough at this time. Yeah. Thought about dyeing my hair red. All right. Okay, cool. It's been good talking to you. And anytime you want to, you come up with a topic. We could do some more of this. And yeah, we should tell Brian to make a bundle with all of our classes, like the ultimate bundle or something like that. 